Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and today I'll be ranking Jane Austen's Priests by Hotness, which I'm sure is exactly the sort of high quality cerebral content you've come to expect from this channel. But before we start thirsting, let me just give you a big fat spoiler warning for every single one of Jane Austen's novels, except for Persuasion. You got that? Spoiler warning for every Jane Austen novel except Persuasion. And just a little extra warning, there will be some foul language in this video. I also want to point out that we're not ranking the hotness of actors here, nor the portrayals of these characters in various adaptations. This is not a Tom Hollander versus Hugh Grant matchup. No, we are ranking the hotness of these priests purely by what they're like in the books. There are quite a few priests in Jane Austen's work, but for this video I'm only considering the ones that either humorously or seriously are presented as potential love interests for the heroine. So with my deepest apologies to fans of Dr. Grant or Mr. Morland or Charles Hayter, unfortunately these men will not be included in this video. I can tell you one thing about this and that's that I'm not going to be taking any of them seriously. I'm afraid if you are after thoughtful literary analysis you must look elsewhere for beyond this point there is only thirst. Bearing that in mind, let's start with the bottom of the pile. Ranked by hotness, this particular person is somewhere around pre-climate change Arctic levels. I am of course talking about Edmund Bertram. Yes, he's dead last. The character who is a full-blown serious romantic interest ranks lower than the comic relief priests. It's no secret that I'm not a fan of Mansfield Park or of Fanny Price, and I know that she has plenty of admirers. Please spare me the sermon. You get it. Sermon. Because it's about priests. Anyway, I don't particularly care for her, but she deserves so much better than Edmund Bertram. Throughout the book, he demonstrates the very minimum of basic human decency, and that's enough to make her swoon. But girl, come on, grow some dignity. This is a man who didn't look at you twice while Mary Crawford was around, who didn't take you seriously enough as an actual person to listen to your concerns about her, and then only settle for you once she's out the picture. Edmund Bertram is in constant preaching mode, which is funny because for most of the book he isn't even ordained. Does he ever say anything that's not moralistic disapproval? He is kind, I'll give him that. He speaks up for Fanny when none of the other Bertrams do, and he gets her a pony. Lovely. On the other hand, he's a condescending ass, and he's also her first cousin. Next up, in fourth place, we have Mr. Collins. And you've got to give him credit for being an absolute icon. As soon as you saw the title of this video, he was what you were thinking of. Don't even try and deny it. He is the quintessential Austin priest, he is a man who knows what he wants, and to poor Mary's dismay, that's not her. And that's as many nice things as I can say about him. He is a horrible person, all things considered. Not just his complete inability to accept the rejection from Elizabeth, but also the way he talks about Lydia when she runs off with Wickham, where he quite literally says that it would be better if she was dead. What a lovely fellow. Mr. Collins is the perfect example of a character you love to hate. He's shallow, he's arrogant, he has a completely inflated sense of self-importance, and he's hilariously socially incompetent. His deferential treatment of Lady Catherine, and by extension of her nephew, Mr. Darcy, leads to some excellent uh, tension in Pride and Prejudice, and his truly cringeworthy attempt at courting Elizabeth leads to one of the best rejection speeches in uh, all of Jane Austen's work, although I would argue only the second best rejection speech in Pride and Prejudice itself. And finally, his future wife Charlotte's easy manipulation of him ensures that despite his general insufferability, he ends up in a marriage with someone who doesn't regret it, and that's also nice to know. Let's move on to number three, and that's Edward Ferrers. He is so bland that I genuinely struggle to find enough things to say about him for the purpose of this video. In fact, it's his blandness, weirdly, that draws Eleanor Dashwood to him. Can't say I get it, but okay. It's not even just that he's boring, it's also that he's spineless for so much of the book. And to be fair, by the end of the novel he does grow some actual balls, first in standing by Lucy Steele when their engagement comes to light, um, when him dropping her would be considered 
incredibly discourteous and dishonorable. And secondly, in getting engaged to Ellen Dashwood, completely against the wishes of his mother and sister. Credit where credit's due, by the end of the story he stands up to his own family, to the point where they completely disown him and cut him off. But what I dislike about Edward, and the reason why he's in third place here, right in the middle of the ranking, is this insistence of his that the reason why he was so easily persuaded to enter a secret engagement with Lucy Steele was his subpar education. Like, really dude, you're blaming the worst decision of your life on your teachers? And similarly, he blames his shyness and general lack of personality on his idleness, on the way that his family forced him to do nothing with his life. Again, take some responsibility, Edward. Just a little bit of responsibility for his own actions would make him a lot hotter. Other than that, there really isn't that much to say about Edward. Eleanor deserved better. In second place, and yes, I'm as surprised as you are, is Mr. Elton. Is he hot? Not really, but he's funny, and that goes some of the way. Sure, he's not funny on purpose, he's not deliberately funny, but he can't have everything. He's often relegated to second place behind Mr. Collins when we think about the ridiculous Austin Priest. And you can see why the two of them are often listed alongside each other. They're both suitors of the heroine and are subsequently rejected by her. And they're also both entirely full of themselves, but in very different ways. Mr. Elton is a man of fashion. He is good looking and he knows it. He uses Sunday service as his own personal time to shine. And honestly, you've got to respect that. When it comes to his romantic ambitions, no one but the squire's daughter will do. And he doesn't take Emma's refusal particularly well, which is perhaps a theme when it comes to the jilted lovers of Austen's novels. Let's not beat about the bush here. He is cruel, both in his rejection of Harriet and in the way he talks to Emma when she rejects him. He's not a good person, but then we're not ranking these priests on goodness, are we? But when Mr. Elton comes back with his new wife, that's when we really get to see the best of him. She is just as insufferable as he is and just as hilarious. And now he's no longer a single man on the lookout for a wife. He's actually incredibly fun. As part of the Highbury Ensemble, him and Mrs. E are just delightful to read about. So is he a hot priest? <laughs> uh, no. But if I'm completely honest, there is only one man in all of Austin's work that can rightfully claim that title, and that is, of course, our number one, Mr. Henry Tilney. It's easy to forget that Henry Tilney is a clergyman because it comes up maybe twice in the entirety of Northanger Abbey. Once when we're first introduced to him, and then later when uh, Catherine is taken on a visit to his parsonage, and that's when his father still thinks that she's incredibly rich. Unlike the other priests in Austen's work, Henry Tilney is quite rich himself. He's also very witty. He's by far the hottest vicar, and I would argue the hottest of Jane Austen's romantic interests overall, although that's not the subject of this video. He is the funniest of Austen's men, and by that I mean the most deliberately funny, the most consciously funny. He jokes around with Catherine almost upon meeting her. He has a sense of humour that I personally enjoy. He also uh, has a wonderful relationship with his sister. Uh, really light-hearted, they take the piss out of each other, they have fun. It's a far cry from the solemnity of Mr. Darcy or the moralising Mr. Knightley. He also takes an interest in Catherine in a way that goes beyond personality. Like, a lot of the time in Austen's work, we just have to accept that two people fall in love because of the way their temperaments align, their characters or their dispositions, to use another austin word. But so rarely do we actually get to see two people who are interested in each other romantically talk on specific subjects that uh, either one or the other cares about. There are some couples in Austen's work that barely seem to have any interest in common, but that's not the case here. Because the first thing we learn about Catherine right at the beginning of the book is that she loves reading. She really likes books, in particular she likes gothic romances, novels that don't enjoy the best reputation among the respectable set. And we see in the reaction of John Thorpe, for example, that at least he considers them beneath his notice, that they are considered a feminine hobby that no real man could possibly enjoy. 
Remind me at some point to make a video about John Thorpe and toxic masculinity. But then there's Henry Tilney, who hasn't just read those same novels that Catherine has, but also enjoyed them. Sure, he doesn't take them quite as seriously as Catherine. He's not as young and naive as she is, but he's also not embarrassed by them. There is an absolutely precious scene with Henry Tilney and his sister, Eleanor, where she talks about how they were reading The Mysteries of Udolpha together, and then he just steals the book from her and doesn't return it until he's finished reading it because he got so into it. He is just unashamed about his enjoyment of gruesome gothic romances and he talks about them with confidence in the same way as he talks with confidence about muslin and dresses and other subjects of feminine interest that men like John Thorpe are proud to be ignorant of. And that passion, that interest, is something we don't really see in other Austen men. What exactly are Captain Wentworth's hobbies other than, like, sulking? Or Mr. Darcy's? I do apologise for having a go at Mr. Darcy throughout this video. I like him, I honestly do. But back to Tilney. His romance with Catherine is deliciously drama-free. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of drama in the book, but very little stems from tensions between them. The closest we get to that is when he finds out about the horrible things that Catherine has been imagining about his father. So he gives her a stern talking to, and then it's all good again. And here we get to the only real issue I have with him. He definitely enjoys explaining things to Catherine a little too much. You know, lecturing her. And I think we all know that type of man, who always talks in a slight tone of condescension, who always explains things to you whether you want him to or not. He likes that Catherine is naive and young and asks questions about like art and the aesthetics of landscapes. Even Eleanor picks up on that tendency of his to, uh, to play the teacher. So he's not perfect, but I think he's earned his spot right at the top of this list. He is by far the hottest and I would argue the only hot priest in Jane Austen's work. And if you are one of the dozens of people right now shouting at the screen about how I'm wrong, you know where to find the comment box. Can't wait to read your impassioned defense of Mr. Collins. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.